Okay, this video is Dr. McDougall compared to Dr. Rogers. And so what is this all about? Well, Dr. McDougall is the best nutrition doctor in the world and I want to become one of the great ones. So you got to compare yourself and see what you can learn, what you need to do. Um, I would probably rank them at this time. McDougall the best in the world. He's the best educator. Um, Esselstyn, you know, deserves a Nobel Prize for he figured out how to cure coronary artery disease. He's a little bit of a one-trick pony though in some ways. Um, but, you know, like I said, I think he deserves a Nobel Prize for that. Same thing with Campbell for his work on the relationship between uh, animal protein and cancer. And Dr. Ornish for his work on telomeres, his work on coronary artery disease, um, as well as his work on prostate cancer. It's extraordinary. Okay. Um, McDougall's more of a teacher and a, and a popularizer and communicates with more patients and communicates very well. Um, Bernard's a fantastic communicator. His books are great. He's done some research, not as much in as detail as, as these guys' studies, um, or of a different nature, let's leave it at that. I think he promotes soy a little bit too much, but he's, you know, he's a fantastic nutrition doctor, and the guy's brilliant. Okay, um, some other things. What does McDougall focus on? He talks directly to patients, and he focuses on general overall health, being reasonably healthy so you can have a good life. Okay, that's great, but I'm actually coming from a different location. My main thing is I mainly talk to doctors. I'm used to talking to people who are pretty educated, pretty motivated, and who are interested in the mechanisms. McDougall will say, who cares about the details of the mechanism? You just eat the right food and you'll get better. And that's a little bit like the perspective of Walter Kempner. Walter Kempner would say, you know it works, just do it, do it, eat the food, eat the rice, low salt rice, for example. And I think, you know, it's true. If you look at the epidemiology, McDougall knows the nutrition literature from before 2000 better than anyone else, and he's pretty good with the stuff after that as well. And he'll basically say, look, the mechanism doesn't matter. We know this is what makes people healthy. Um, my point of view is I also am interested in the brain. There's virtually no one else that I'm aware of talking about nutrition for the brain. And the brain's more fussy. It cares more about a lot of technical little details. And so it makes you be more careful about what's okay and what's not okay. Um, also, I kind of, you know, this little picture in a box is, is moving the other things. I'm also, I, you know, I came from being a college athlete with world champion coaches and I got injured. Otherwise, I could have been of that caliber, not necessarily quite as good as them. But I, anyways, getting injured really set me back. And what I'm trying to say is I'm interested in top athletic performance. You know, how does somebody become the best at their sport? Um, also in top academics, I came from an intense academic competition at places like Stanford. I've also been at Harvard and some other pretty fancy academic places. So, I'm going to write on a much wider variety of things. I'm interested in the mechanism of disease, the biochemistry of it, the pathophysiology, being able to convince other physician experts. So I actually think McDougall and myself are very complementary. He's sort of like uh, the doctor of the common man, and he tells you what you need to know to get better and have good general health, have a good general life. Whereas I'm more like, what will make you like the smartest in your class? What will help you to be the best aging person of all your friends, okay? I want to age the best of all the doctors my age. Um, so I'm, I'm more interested in high performance details. And I like knowing mechanisms because I think it leads to additional insights. Um, so in addition to most of the internet videos on nutrition, they're all sort of like baby talk. And um, also if you look at most of the science video, biochemistry videos on the internet, they're mostly like, you know, helping college students, pre-meds, and, and medical students prepare for their exams. Okay, that's Mickey Mouse biochemistry. And it's also sort of what I would describe as pharmacology-based, preparing them to be able to prescribe drugs versus there's virtually no one except other individual experts out there who are trying to say what really causes this disease. What could be done that we can, what can we understand about it that might help us to prevent it? There's no money in those things. Money comes from, here's the drug you can prescribe and here's why you can prescribe this drug but it doesn't come from a deep understanding but I think a deep understanding enables you to potentially avoid getting the disease like you know the great insights of Brownlee and Shellman to figure out that dietary fat caused diabetes I mean don't get me wrong there's other doctors who help figure that out as well as you know Sweeney, Hemsworth, Rabinowich etc but Okay, what else? Uh, McDougall wrote a fantastic newsletter. That's a great resource for anyone to go to. It is drmcdougall.com website, and I've certainly learned a lot from it, as well as his books. He's written several excellent books. He writes only about nutrition 
and disease related to nutrition. He doesn't stray from that. Sort of that's who he is, what he is, and what he does. He's about 76 years old, Irish American from Michigan. He's quietly Christian, but in his mind, from the way it looks, it seems like he considers it inappropriate for public lectures. Plus, he runs a business, a telehealth consulting patient, versus, you know, I'm a 58 year old Irish Puerto Rican American from Chicago. I'm overtly Christian just because. I think, you know, society is going down the tubes and the only hope, in my opinion, is that there's sort of Christian ethics for society. It doesn't, anybody can be whatever religion they want, but I think if you don't have a society that agrees on like biblical Christian ethics of, you know, love thy neighbor, the golden rule, help others, you know, forgive all this stuff, you're going to have endless uh, degradation of society, which I believe we're seeing today, and I believe we're on a road to return to serfdom and slavery. And if you think that's underestimated, I've read about it very extensively in, in all the other countries and the parallels to us, to the Roman Empire, and to other, you know, sad uh, situations in countries in the 1900s, as we all know. And I think we're going down that path. Man with atheism cannot live in peace. I hate to say that, but what I've seen is any atheistic society, it always leads to cruelty and essentially a return to serfdom and slavery. Um, take a look at Russia in the 1900s. Okay, uh, what else? Um, McDougal, like I said, I'll write on a much wider variety of topics than McDougal. I was real interested in study skills, improving IQ. I, I saw this great realization. I saw people of seemingly in, equal intellectual ability, but some of them would do fantastic and others would do poorly. And so you have to get your personal philosophy correct. And you raise your IQ at least 30 points, knowing study skills, memory systems. Why not learn all that stuff? Grade schools and high schools do not teach academic skills, study skills, memory skills. And I know this because I deal with tons of medical students, doctors, and they don't know how to learn effectively. It's not a joke. I, I actually, like I said, I coached a guy who flunked his boards five times, got a real high IQ. I just, you know, studied with him about three times and then he passes after all these years of flunking. Um, what else? I'm interested very much so in the biochemistry and pathophysiology, also in literature, art, and culture. And again, I think that they go together. They're, they're, they're not, I mean, don't get me wrong, you don't need literature, art, and culture for, for science. But what happens is if you don't have literature, art, and culture, the science tends to become dishonest. I can tell you, atheistic science is fundamentally dishonest in my experience. Um, it's, it's amazing how dishonest medical journals are, college science textbooks are. When I say dishonest, what I mean by that is, for example, um, evolutionary biology is claimed to explain origin of life. It has nothing to do with origin of life. And when you claim that, you're basically describing it as a religion. <laughs> origin of life is a totally different subject from evolutionary biology, but most people think it does. And it's basically used as a creation story for atheism. So I end up thinking that ends up being relevant. Okay, um, what else? What was the transformation event for Dr. McDougall? He had a stroke as a teenager, which he attributes to his bad diet and cigarette smoking. Which certainly didn't help, but I'm going to bet you it was probably a dissection just because, you know, I'm a neuroradiologist, one of the things I do. And, you know, you almost never see an atherosclerotic stroke in a young person um, of, you know, due to atherosclerosis itself. You know, you'll see an isolated sickle cell anemia stroke, but that's a different problem of, you know, hyperthrombotic blood. Transforma transformation event for me was I got fat in my 30s, which really surprised me when I was totally overworked, kind of doing two fellowships simultaneously. I initially considered being an interventional neuroradiologist, which is like an endovascular imaging guided surgeon. But then I, I kind of decided not to do that. Uh, that's largely been taken over by neurosurgery. Okay, my mom died of cancer, and um, that was a major traumatic psychological experience for me. I was closest to her to anybody in the whole world. My dad had a coronary artery bypass graft followed by a stroke, and I was kind of shocked how that all turned out. And so that got me to re-examine all my priorities and my understanding of medicine and health and led to me to doing tons and tons of reading. I have a real boring life, okay? So, you know, my kids are growing up, you know, my, my wife, I don't have that much uh, time with her. So what I'm saying is I got a lot of time to read. I got nothing else to do. And man, I read pretty deep on a lot of subjects. And I know from, I just know, cause I talk to doctors all the time and I don't even know any doctor in my ballpark on, on any of these subjects um, personally. I mean, I know a lot of really, really bright high IQ doctors but they don't have that intellectual curiosity to really understand stuff outside their own field. Uh, it was in my experience. Um, med school, I heard that McDougal graduated first in his class. I would believe it. He's super bright. Um, I won the award as the best student in my medical class. Uh, the dean wrote the foreword for my book, Medical Student's Guide to Top Board Scores. 
Um, I won. There's only one award, you know, 333 students in my class for pathology, and it's considered the most important subject. I won the award best student for that. I had 99s on my diagnostic uh, written boards for uh, radiology residency. I did a surgical internship, um, then fellowships in interventional radiology, which is imaging guided surgery, and neuroradiology. Um, I did an unofficial six month fellowship in uh, endovascular brain surgery, which is called interventional neuroradiology, but like I said, I wouldn't continue it because there's problems with that field. Uh, McDougall did an internal medicine. So McDougall's pretty much straight internal medicine in his training and his background. And medical school is kind of like internal medicine. So I've, I've came from a much wider, different perspective. I'm pretty comfortable with surgical literature. I spent tons of my time in my life talking to surgeons and hanging around with surgeons. And um, I'm also pretty comfortable with sort of like the biochemistry aspect of diseases, the molecular biology, all that stuff. What happened to McDougall is he became disillusioned in Hawaii when he saw, you know, he learned in basically in med school and residency of internal medicine, match the ill to the pill and send the bill. But later on, you start to see it never cures the chronic diseases. It doesn't work that well. And so once he became disillusioned with that, he'd been influenced by Dennis Burkett, who was the Irish physician doing missionary work in Africa, who figured out all these uh, chronic diseases tend to be associated with the westernized diet and the lack of dietary fiber. Uh, McDougall also, you know, was very bright and inquisitive and learned from Walter Kempner, from Nathan Pritikin, and he wrote fantastic books and did a ton of research writing those books and um, writing his newsletters. Uh, so, you know, he did a fantastic job. He got lots of fantastic testimonials and he wrote some excellent publications on his, his work. Um, I tried doing research, but all my stuff won't get funded and I got really annoyed with it. That's partly why I started writing books. Um, and then making YouTube lectures because basically in medicine, it's much worse now than it used to be. Anything that does not generate money, uh, it probably, no one cares about it. And if it's irrelevant or it just goes with the status quo, that can get published. But anything that makes a giant change, for example, I developed an ischemic theory of spine disease, not just for ischemia, degenerative disease, and lumbar spine. That had been known for a while back. But the realization that that explains virtually all this degenerative patterns of OPLL, ossification of posterior longitude and ligament, dish in the cervical spine, and it, expa it explains probably OLF, ossification of ligamentum flavum, and all that stuff, chalk stick fractures. So what I'm trying to say is this idea of a nutritional major component to back pain, no one wants to hear that in the spine community because there's no money in it. And my attitude is it should just be part of treatment of spine disease. Instead of being outright rejected, it should be part of spine disease. All the neuroradiologists I know, as soon as I explain to them, they go, that's great, that's right, okay? Don't get me wrong, there's a little bit of other things that factor into it. Not much, but I think F minus GP factor into it, okay? Um, in addition, you know, I developed the whole theory of dementia, the one that's good. You know, Delatorius theory and my theory are the two best ones, you know, neurovascular coupling. And then you read a neurology textbook. They're a joke. The neurology textbook on dementia is an absolute joke. Alzheimer's disease is the biggest joke. Basically, what they say is we don't know how to diagnose this. We don't know what it really is, but take our pill, which we know it doesn't work. But, you know, why don't you give it a try? I mean, that's absolutely stupid. You know, people laugh at a doctor from, you know, 1700s doing a therapeutic phlebotomy for everything. Well, guess what? In, in the recent times, it's give a drug for everything, even though you don't even know what the drug does and you don't even know if it works. I mean, that's ridiculous. Or you could say, well, we know the mechanism of the drug, right, but you can't explain what it does and all its side effects, so you don't really understand it. And you know it doesn't work, so what's the point? Like for Alzheimer's, I mean, give me a break. It's a joke. It's such a joke, it's not even funny, but everyone pretends it's real. It's the emperor has no clothes, okay? Um, yeah, my background too, I came from Stanford. I student athlete of the year, set the record for wins in a season, was coached by World Olympic sh champions. Mark and Dave Schultz were, you know, in the Fox Catcher fame. Uh, that's a great book by Mark Schultz, that Foxcatcher book of wrestling. Um, let's see, what else could be at all interesting? Oh, and having been at the Ivy League places, and I've been at some other pretty uh, top-notch medical centers, I kind of learned that basically they do what everybody else does. Their whole view is based <clears throat> centered around drugs and surgery. And don't get me wrong, surgery can do a lot of great things, and drugs in some situations can do good things. But they don't work well when they're applied to dietary diseases. That's just a fact. And the majority of diseases are due to diet and toxins. And so they're basically at a pretty fundamental level. They're just as ignorant as any other place. So I'm, I'm not intimidated by them at all. I was the smartest guy in my in my imaging guided surgery group when I was there. And so I, I don't, which is good, because a lot of people will blow, oh, you know, it comes from this fancy university. Yeah, BS. The, the way they do things is just as stupid as any other place. Um, Let's see, what else? Um, 
I was influenced by McDougal. McDougal did help me when I went through my fat phase. I was a little bit of a sticking point on losing weight, and then I read about his idea on starch, and things went real fast after that. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, I was also influenced a lot more by a lot. I've read tons and tons about science, the history of literature, the history of science, the history of civilization, the history of religion. Like I said, I kind of had a boring life, and I grew up in a family where my, daughter, my dad was a doctor, an Irish doctor, a reader, and he'd argue with his brothers about books. So from a young age, I've been arguing a lot about philosophy, literature, religion, and um, I put a lot of effort into trying to understand it. And I think it relates you know, to mankind's happiness and uh, financial success in this world. You know, So... I, I read all these li these authors, non-denominational, you know, like Ayn Rand's genius of economics and stuff. I mean, what more could you want? Harry Lorraine and his books on memory techniques. You know, I saw my ac academic abilities just take off once I developed all these memorization study skill techniques. I went from being afraid I'm going to flunk out at Stanford to just walking in the room knowing I was the best student in the room. And that's, that's what comes from having academic skills and memorization techniques. Um... So, you know, Francis Christensen, he's the guy who figured out, you know, you have to make all these asides when you're, uh, I always I always get his word confused with apoptosis uh, for inserting all these asides into your writing. Um, you know, what's my disadvantage? I work mostly as a neuroradiologist, also a little bit as an interventional radiologist, not that much anymore, mostly as a neuroradiologist. I do general radiology as well. And then as a hobby, I do all this nutrition consulting for lots of friends and doctors and people who call me and stuff. But um, I teach as a hobby. Um, I make my YouTube videos as all as a hobby. I would love to do nutrition and pathophysiology teaching and be a professor full time, but I don't see any money in it. If I could make money doing it, I would do that, okay? I like being a neuroradiologist. I like having a tough case. I got some real smart uh, doctor friends who I like talking to about neuroradiology cases. That's a lot of fun. Um, but uh, anyway, so basically, McDougal's the best in the world, and he's done a tremendous thing. He's provided a wonderful service to mankind with all his teaching and his um, ability to very clearly communicate you know, all the great work that's been done in research. And he reads that, that nutrition literature like a maniac. Um, I'll be more likely to spend my time reading biochemistry books by legacy authors, you know, when they're ready to retire, like Richard Moore, you know, his whole life he spent studying ion pumps and he figured them all out, okay? Jack Delatore, he spent trying to understand dementia, he devoted his life to it. And these guys, a lot of times these brilliant scientists, when they're getting ready to retire, kind of like what Campbell is, Campbell is with animal protein nutrition. They write a book that clarifies their entire field. And once you've got that, you can read all the literature in their field very easily. But before you've got that, it's hard to put it all together. So anyways, I'm going to try to become one of the all-time great nutrition doctors. I certainly have a lot to learn, but I'm making progress and I enjoy it and I'm going to help people. I don't give a rat's ass. I don't have to sell anybody anything. I don't have a, 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 a clinic to promote. Um, I'll try to answer whatever questions anybody might have on my YouTube channel. Most of the time I'll answer them. Some of them I won't answer. Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I'm too busy to bother with it. But um, anyways, I feel like, oh yeah, one thing I'd say is different is like I'm not trying to save the world. I think it's impossible. I know most people, I meet a lot of people who are very nice, but they have no intellectual curiosity. They're sort of basically functional illiterates. They don't read anything. They're not interested in pursuing a subject and learning it. So in my opinion, you really can't help those people. You be nice to them, but they're always going to go with the status quo and be hooked on a bunch of drugs and have a bunch of surgery. You really can't help them. I mean, if because a person has to learn what am I supposed to eat, how much do I need to exercise, avoid toxins and all that. And you either a person either makes the effort to learn or not. And in my experience, most people... They're so lazy and have such low curiosity, they're incapable of learning. I'm, I'm sorry, and they're also fixed in their ways, and they're offended if you correct what they say. So I'm not trying to be mean, but I, I mean, I'll always be nice to those people. I'll be happy to help one if they ever want help. But in my experience, there's nothing you could do with that crowd. I, I know tons of people. They've been fat for 30, 40 years. Um, whereas I'm trying to really help the motivated you know, intellectual people that seek learning and knowledge and want to understand things as best as that could be done. So... I'll do the best I can to try to help people with this channel. That's what I've been doing. Hope, hope you find it helpful.